Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Aguilar, SPJ's president-elect. Tonight, the SPJ New England chapter, along with SPJ's Diversity and Inclusion Committee, bring you a one-hour conversation with three of the best journalists in our country. We'll talk about the challenges they face as Muslims inside and outside our newsrooms. And by the way, if you want to share what we're saying, please use the hashtag SPJ Diversity. So let me introduce you to our three journalists, and then we'll start talking. Roweda Abdelaziz is a national reporter for HuffPost. She focuses on civil rights and social justice issues that impact the Muslim American communities. Roweda spearheads the coverage of Islamophobia and reports on the intersection of anti-Muslim sentiment within politics, culture, and gender. Through her work, she has exposed anti-Muslim policies and legislation that have led to the reunification of families and the reopening of hate crime cases. Eamon Ismail is a staff writer at Slate Magazine. Eamon also wrote and produced Who's Afraid of Eamon Ismail? It's a great video series you can find on YouTube. He explores every angle of Muslim Americans. He says to grow up Muslim is to grow up being feared. So he traveled around the country to find out if there really is a reason, he says, to be afraid of American Muslims. And there is also Tahera Rahman. And she's a reporter at KXAN News, the award-winning NBC station in Austin, Texas. Before that, she worked at a CBS station in the Quad Cities, where she made history. She broke a barrier in 2018. Tahera became the first TV reporter in the US to wear a hijab. It made national news because finally, Muslim female journalists could fully represent themselves on American television. So welcome everyone, good to see you tonight. I know you're all busy, do a wave. Good thank to see you. For you. Having us. <laughs> of course, thank you. And I know that we have one hour because I know many of you are, are covering the, the Biden-Harris um, election. And so we'll make sure we get off on time. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the Biden-Harris win. You know, one of the things I didn't see very much, unless maybe it was in the local cities, is uh, coverage of the Muslim community and, and the politics. You know, were they for Trump or were they for uh, Biden? You know, tonight, you know, any of you, you know, or I'll start with Eamon. What is the feel, do you think, in the Muslim community over what's happened with the election results? What do you think? Ooh, well, it's, it's kind of hard to say because there's so many different kinds of Muslims and there's Muslims in every uh, aspect of life here in America. You know, you have white Muslims, black Muslims, uh, they're both Muslim, but they probably have very different opinions on uh, on Trump, you know. Um, I saw one exit poll that said that 35% of the party uh, of Muslims voted for Trump. So it's kind of it's kind of hard to say well, like what Muslims think about Trump, but I can tell you how I feel. Uh, I'm really, really happy. Uh, it kind of feels like I was able to take my first uh, breath of fresh air in four years. Uh, I had a stupid tweet today about how there, for real, there were going to be thousands and thousands of Muslims celebrating in Jersey City, referencing to him um, his his wild lie about how Muslims were celebrating 9-11 in Jersey City. So uh, I'm just really excited to not have to fact check him uh, to people who might not know any Muslims in real life. So yeah. I'm happy. Roweda, what do you think? One of the things that I noticed in an interview you had done, um, you know, I think earlier and a few months ago was that you you definitely had talked about, you know, how the, the travel ban and even when Mr. Trump was, um, when Mr. Trump was campaigning the first time, there was his thing about, you know, you should be against all, uh, anybody who believed in Islam. Tell me about your feelings uh, that, well, not your feelings, but what do you think the Muslim community is feeling tonight? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I'm going to throw that same caveat that Ayman, you know, threw in is just that the Muslim Americans are the most diverse, most diverse faith group in the country as they are in the world. And so there's a lot of components racially, um, you know, they lean different ways politically, but we know from some statistics that 64% of Muslim Americans identify as a Democrat. Um, and a, around that same number, around like 64 to 65% of Muslim Americans, according to a recent NPR poll, voted for um, President Biden. We also know that, you know, Biden wasn't the first choice for a lot of Muslim Americans that I've spoken to over the last few years. A lot of them uh, were very excited and were Bernie Sanders supporters during the Democratic primary, but decided to vote for Trump because 
they didn't see benefit to him. And in fact, they point to his harmful policies, uh, minus the 35% of you know Muslim Americans who did vote for him. And so I think there's a sigh of relief, a collective relief from, from those Muslim Americans that I've spoken to. Um, and they are looking forward to uh, a Biden administration that has vowed to repeal the travel ban on his first day in office. Um, and made other very uh, similar promises and made an entire agenda, actually. He had a Muslim American agenda um, that included better hate crime legislations and just regular you know, issues that pertain to Muslim Americans like better health care um, mm-hmm. and creating a safe environment for, for kids in school. Um, I think a lot of them are, are a little hesitant because you know Biden, having worked in the Obama administration, carries the legacy of Obama policies, many of which um, also a sizable amount of Muslim Americans were not the biggest fans of, um, specifically his foreign policy. But I think at the end of the day, um, there is more joy in the choice of them having voted and seeing Biden succeeded than another four years of a Trump presidency. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tahera, you're in Texas. You know, everybody thought maybe Texas was going to turn blue. We do know that there are a lot of Muslim and uh, Muslim immigrants in in. Houston, a uh, big population growing in, in, in Dallas. I'm not sure how big it is in Austin, but your feel on this, you, what do you think the Texas Muslims are feeling tonight? You know, I think that it echoes the, um, the national numbers that Ru- Ruweda just talked about. And um, even of course, what Ayman said about having such a diverse slate of opinions. Um, I think it very much mirrors the fact that Yes, they. I think a majority of them were, I would say, like twice as excited for Biden. For I'm sorry, for Bernie as they were for Biden. Um, but it was kind of uh, in their minds, you know, he still took steps to normalize and welcome Muslim Americans in the way that they didn't feel was coming from Trump. And of course, we mentioned some of those policies already that that you know he took aim at Muslims, Muslim demographics, and. I think even then it's interesting to see that there are a lot of Muslims who voted for Trump the first time in 2016 and as well as uh, in 2020. And I think it is interesting to delve into that because it's a lot of the same reasonings as people voted for him um, in other demographics, mainly the economy. That's what they cited. So I think that it's interesting to know the reasons why some Muslims um, went one way or the other, but overall, I think it stands the same in Texas or Texas Muslims as it does around the country. I think collectively they are um, relieved. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about you three, because first of all, you know, to me, looking into your backgrounds as I was, you know, uh, learning about all three of you, because this is really the first time we're meeting, I was very impressed about how you have all created your own journey here but also you created your own path for other Muslim journalists. So how did you do that? I mean, you know, here's the thing, all of you, whether, you know, whether it's you, Tahera, who said, you know what, I, I'm gonna wear, you know, I, I'm definitely gonna wear my headscarf. This is part of me. This is me or aim it. You know, you had a video series. They, I mean, honestly, I'm telling you everybody, this should be on Netflix. This series teaches people about Muslims about Muslims, people who are against Muslims, you know, definitely a diverse group within, um, you know, the Muslim community. And, you know, one of the things about Roweda is, you, you know, how you have focused on, on Islamophobia, you've been enabled to, you know, basically flush out what I say is, is you know, the, the, the discrimination and even the hate. But you know what, when you went to your news directors and said, hey, I have this idea, you know, whether it is you wearing your headscarf and being all you or having the idea of look, you know what, I want to focus on Islamophobia. How did you guys do it? How did you bring up that conversation? Who wants to take that one first? Okay, Eamon, I'm throwing you in there. All right, let's do it. Uh, I think uh, one thing that I think every first has to do oops, uh, is, is prove to their editors that they have value, right? Um, I think there's a little bit of um, a hesitance, I think, a reluctance to hire people who don't come from uh, very sophisticated journalist backgrounds, having gone to graduate school, especially at places like, um, you know, like Slate Magazine or the New York Times. Uh, but one thing I think uh, 
that, especially from like the way it does work and the how it does work, uh, is we're showing the value in having that special kind of access to our own communities, which uh, for better or worse is itself just newsworthy, right? So um, I think when when you think about like code switching and how everyone has different versions of themselves and they're always trying to negotiate which version of the film they're trying to they're trying to present. Journalists do that, but also uh, their subjects do that. And I think uh, you're more likely to get a, a more real, honest version of your subject uh, if they're Muslim, if you send in a Muslim reporter. So there is a lot of value, I think, in having Muslim reporters in your roster um, that I think maybe editors are starting to pay attention to. Rueda, what do you think? Absolutely. I mean, I think for the larger Muslim American community, we know this for a fact. It's not uh, really anything new that the media has not been particularly friendly to Muslims. The coverage of Muslim Americans is predominantly one dimensional. It's very reactionary. It's consistently tying uh, an American community to issues of national security, the war on terror and just foreign policy as a whole. And I think for the longest time, because of this constant demonization and vilification of Muslims and just portraying them as other, uh, Muslim Americans were hesitant to, to get involved in media to begin with. And I think to even just engage with media, whether it's doing interviews, because when they've done it, um, it's only worked against them. And I think for the longest time, there was this disconnect. And this is this is a mere fact, study uh, after study has proven that the coverage of Muslim Americans, and when I say negative, I'm not, I'm not saying that it needs to be um, preach the faith, but I think it, it doesn't humanize a community and give it the complexities that it, it deserves, especially a community that is so diverse, like the Muslim American community. And so I think many of us know this for a fact. I mean, it was one of my motivating reasons as to why I wanted to go into journalism. And even though I didn't cover Islamophobia to begin with, I was primarily on the foreign policy beat and it was covering a lot of the refugee crisis that was happening abroad. I realized I was doing a lot of handholding in my newsroom and giving folks sources and, and teaching them um, about the importance of words and language and challenging and pushing back certain narratives um, in all the places that I've been to, not specific to HuffPost. I mean, I'm blessed to be on a national outlet that allows me to say the word Islamophobia. Surprisingly, there are plenty of places that do not allow that word. Uh, people want to substitute it. They have qualms with it. They want to say anti-Muslim sentiment, but they don't want to acknowledge the word because in the breadth of, of the situation. And so um, they were, you know, I'm really blessed to be in a position where I went from the doing a lot of the back work and then the guidance and the editorial decisions and handholding to do it on the doing it on the front lines. And like Ayman said, we are put in, in a unique position where we are able to understand the qualms of the community. We understand why they're hesitant. We are able to educate them who may not know what it means to, you know, what are the repercussions of coming on TV or publishing my name, right? And I think um, having us having the patience and the access, right? And instead of say uh, someone who's a white male reporter who still is thinking about what should I wear when I go to a mosque? Uh, how do I interact with the opposite gender? Um, how do, you know, some of the small basic things that may or may not make a difference. I think we as Muslims, instead of starting at point zero, um, as Muslim journalists, we're starting at point 10. And this is, you know, I argue allows us to get into the, the meat of a story and, and to get the hard hitting things that we do need because we already have that factor of trust. Now you don't need to be a Muslim journalist to do good journalism covering the Muslim American community. But I think um, we've seen the types of works, you know, like Ayman's works, like, you know, Tahira's works, like other folks' works. When you are able to, to have that access um, to these certain communities. And so I, I pivoted to covering uh, more domestic policies and social justice issues here in the US at 2016. And um, it's been a, a great, a great journey since and results in things like having the first hijabi anchor, right, on, on TV um, in the Midwest. And so I think we're starting to make good headway. Mm -hmm. uh, Tahera, do you feel the same way? I mean, because, you know, you, you've worked in television behind the scenes, in front of the camera, you know, I mean, I know that you made this breakthrough in the Quad Cities, but had you had pushback before that? Or were you reluctant to, to say, you know, accept me as I am? Yes, to all of it. <laughs> um, and I think it's it's definitely worth noting that 
once we are in the positions that we are, we, we count ourselves lucky and blessed. And, you know, honestly, we, at least I do, I feel like I have um, a duty, you know, and on, on many different levels. But once you're in that position, does it mean the pushback stops? And so that's something that I wanna to highlight too, is that yes, there were a lot of obstacles for me to get to the point where I was. I mean, the Quad Cities, what, that what, was- What kind of obstacles? Because, you know, yeah, you made this breakthrough and, and, and I saw you, you know, you were on NBC and you were on these national shows and all that thing. But I want people to know what kind of pushback you got or, or possibly even the first time you appeared on camera, maybe hate mail, maybe, you know, those ugly people on Twitter, I'm not sure. Yeah, definitely. The social media, uh, the social media trolls came out to play for sure. Um, and they, they, they told my station, you know, in Facebook comments, Facebook messages um, that, you know, they wouldn't watch us anymore. That they were going to turn the channel. This was the last time they're going to watch uh, WHBF. And, you know, and it came to me personally on my Instagram, my Twitter, whatever. Um, and that is, something that I was expecting, obviously. I think we all think about that, even when we walk out the door, especially as Muslim women that wear hijab, you, we know that we're gonna step into places where we will look different out of every single person in the room. And so we're used to walking like that. We're used to still walking in confidence and being confident in who we are and what we believe in anyway. So that was just a mental preparation on my end. And my station and I talked about that um, the leaders of the station, we, for, I want to say about a month, they had hired a security guard to follow me around on my stories. And so, yeah, it's something we didn't tell people because we didn't want them to know. Um, but when you have an armed security guard following you around and you're asking people for interviews, it makes it a little bit harder. So <laughs> that was a little challenging, but I was grateful for that support. Um, mm -hmm. and even online, I made it a, uh, a rule of mine just to not to respond to negativity. And it was nice to see that I didn't have to. There were a lot of other people who kind of jumped in there. And that was my main takeaway from the good and the bad that came out of that spotlight was that for me, I did feel that the negative comments and the negative people were a drop in the bucket compared to the people who were more open-minded and welcoming and looked forward to seeing somebody different that made the newsroom look more like the communities that they're covering. We have growing Muslim communities in every single major city in this country for decades now. And like Roweda said, we are not just tied to foreign politics or foreign policy. We're not just tied to, you know, national events that happen, um, but we are your doctors, we're your physicians, we're your reporters. And I think it, helps that in so many ways, not just for us covering these topics that have to do with the Muslim community and its many aspects, but also just having that re representation and another set of eyes. As a producer, I caught so many things in our rundowns and in scripts that maybe our anchors or other producers wrote, and I, it just struck me the wrong way. And even here at KXAN, I love the station. I love everyone I work with. Um, but one of the first few months I was here, we did a story about a Muslim private school and the headline just rubbed me the wrong way. And it, 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 it pointed it out that it was a Muslim private school that had this issue. And I sent an email to uh, management and the reporter who worked on the story. And I said, I may be overthinking this and overly sensitive, but I think that if this were a Catholic private school, we wouldn't have said Catholic private school in the headline we would have just said a private school had this issue. And so it, I think we maybe consider changing the headline and they agreed with me and they did that. And so that just speaks to what a way that says even word choice makes such a big difference when you are trying to go against years and years and years of a narrative that shapes a Muslim community that you had nothing, you didn't have a say in until now. So you're kind of chipping away at those stereotypes from the inside out. And I think it helps in, in that way to have Muslims in, in the newsroom. And, and I think also, you know, as journalists, I think as journalists, we, we just have to speak up. I mean, I, I can totally relate to what all three of you are saying because as a Latina, you know, I notice there's some Latino journalists that, you know, you hear certain things and it's like, wait a minute, this kind of races against my 
the people. But as a journalist, some people keep quiet. Are you seeing that in that when it pertains to Muslim journalists, you know, um, are they speaking up? Are you, uh, you know, you three are obviously people who speak up and, you know, because you were able to accomplish what you have accomplished. Um, you know, whether it's your series or, you know, whether it's your head, uh, you know, your, the stories you cover, you know, is that something that as you three journalists do encourage other Muslim journalists that, hey, you know, speak up, it's okay to, to tell them, you know, you may not want to use that word because it's insensitive. Your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I think, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ryan. Sorry. Go ahead. I, was, I think gen generally speaking, I mean, journalism is still a predominantly white male field, right? I think this doesn't come as a surprise to anyone, whether you're Muslim or not Muslim. And we, especially, I think over the last, you know, couple of months, the media industry, like other industries, had a little bit of a reckoning in terms of its inclusivity. And again, like what Tahara was saying, having reporters to reflect the diversity of the communities that you cover. And it's not just Muslims, right? We're talking about a lot of black and Latino reporters and Asian reporters and, and people from, from different faith groups as well. And so I think journalists are aware. I think we are aware that this is something that needs to be rectified. And I don't think Muslim journalists, you know, uh, are any less aware of this issue, but I think what uh, is a little bit of speaks to what Ayman was saying of this um, code switching, right? We sometimes struggle with this, should I speak up? Are they going to react a certain way? Like my peers or my editors, am I going to be um, tokenized as the Muslim person who is always speaking up, you know, when everybody or someone gets, every time someone gets something wrong. And so I think we have a little bit more of this internal conflict uh, often. I think, you know, I, I absolutely do. But I think we're in this new age of journalism with social media and, and, and cancel culture and the, with its complexities, I say that with a little asterisk on it, that people are a little bit more um, emboldened, I think, to call out when a headline you know, is bad, when a story is poorly written, when, when something um, isn't done with journalistic integrity. And I think because of this really unique access of, of social media platforms, sometimes you know, we're not the ones to do it. We've seen a headline go up on Twitter and it being screenshotted and shared and added so many times where the editors have quietly changed it. We've seen this happen. Um, and I think newsrooms are starting to, again, go through a national reckoning when it comes to not only diverse representation in the newsrooms and challenging who are telling those stories, but how we are telling the stories. So I don't think it is the responsibility of just Muslim reporters to call it out. You can have a reporter, you know, who's Muslim American and doesn't want to write about Muslim issues. They want to write about sports. They want to write about politics. Mm -hmm. They want to write about anything else. And I think the key to representation is not putting us in boxes and giving us the responsibilities to solely call these things out and to report on these issues. Um, you know, I've, I've had reporters and I've met, you know, other Muslim reporters who've come in and just like, I, I just want to talk about pop culture. I really like pop culture and I just want to report on pop culture. And they should be able to do that. But I think because there is this pressure for us to speak on Muslim issues, even when it's not a story I'm working on or if it's not a beat someone covers, uh, that's when it gets, I think, a little problematic. Mm -hmm. Eamon, you were going to add? I think Roya did a great job of explaining it, but I can, I can give you an example of how it might manifest. Um, there was one project that I was doing, it was about Muslim Christmas and, and how uh, different Muslims have different feelings towards Christmas and trying to just, ex just kind of sh illustrate to uh, my audience that there is just a, a very vast experience for Christmas time uh, amongst Muslims. And um, there was this one scene where I was like sitting there cutting out my ornaments. I was cutting out like silly uh, crescent moons to make my Christmas as Muslim as possible. Uh, but there was this one scene where like I held it up and I said, Allahu Akbar, this is the best one, right? Um, my editor had a problem with that. He, he didn't understand that the phrase Allahu Akbar isn't just like a war call. And, and so there was a moment where I had to uh, not only like teach this person who's supposed to be my editor supposed to keep me from making those mistakes uh, that this isn't actually what this is called. And this is why we're here. We're here to show that this isn't just what this phrase is. And we're not, we're showing that this isn't just what this uh, experience is. And, and it takes a little bit of courage, you know, uh, because when you uh, have a relationship with your editor, um, as journalists, you know, uh, your editor is calling the shots 
uh, telling you what's going up and what's not, helping you figure out, sharpen your angles for your stories. And so it, the, the dynamic, uh, you know, makes it difficult for some journalists, any j- journalist who's, who's considered to be like a hyphenated journalist, right, uh, to, to sort of put their foot down and say, no, 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 this is important. This, this is necessary. And, and I think the more that we uh, include Muslims, the more that we include just anyone who's not white male, then I think we're going to have a better, healthier newsroom. And, and one thing I think that we haven't directly acknowledged yet is, um, at least when I was a kid, kid growing up, uh, Muslims are not fans of the news generally uh, because of the ways that Muslims are perceived and talked about in news. And so there is already this, uh, this barrier for entry uh, because first, a, a lot of Muslims, like say the older generation, like my parents, they don't trust the news because of the way the Muslims are talked about. Uh, so I think um, if, if there's like editors who are watching in, just like higher ranking journalists, I think um, don't just assume that because you have a hyphenated editor, a hyphenated writer in the room, they're gonna speak up. I think um, that takes a little bit of courage. So if there was any way that an editor can make it easier asking people before you write about Muslims, for example, uh, I think it's not just a, a nice thing to do, but necessary. Let me jump in here real quick because you bring something up that's very important. How, how do we gain the trust of, of the Muslim uh, community when, you know, when they have lost trust in us because, you know, again, I was around during 9-11. I remember in Dallas, I had never been to, you know, any Muslim community, anything. And then that happens and they hear about the, you know, the, 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 the fires and the bombings. And I'm like, and, you know, I took it upon myself and listen, I'm going to go cover the Muslim community. I want to see what's going on there because, you know, everybody else was headed everywhere else. And I made it an effort and thank God someone took me under their wing to teach me about this, 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 and this, you know, and, and, but I realized gaining trust, I think it helped to be Brown first. So I was accepted immediately, but then I had to gain trust because you're right. You know, the media has never, I, I, has not treated the, the Muslim community with the respect that the community deserves. And you're right, there have been stories, negative, negative stories, not the, you know, the Muslim man who by day works as a CPA by night, he helps feed the homeless, you know, something, something nice, right? So what do we do as journalists? And, and I'm not Muslim, you know, how do I gain the trust if I'm in a, in a city, you know, and I have to go cover the community, what can I do to gain their trust as a journalist? Please, you know, because there's journalists listening to this and they need that help. Anybody take it. I would say to start with forming the relationship as you know, just tomorrow, start tomorrow. Um, reach out to the local mosque. There's usually more than one in your area. And sometimes they might have different demographics. Some are more diverse than others. Reach out to all of them, reach out to the leadership. Um, explain that you can't guarantee coverage for everything, but you would love to know everything that's going on. That's something that even in my Muslim community here, they'll send me all these things. And I'll, and that's something we tell everyone is I can't guarantee we're gonna be there on Saturday or Sunday's events, but thank you for, giving it to me and I'm going to send it their way and put it on the agenda for the day. So I think that helps. And it, 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 it's something we do for a lot of other communities, but I don't know why it's not, um, it's not something that's done automatically for Muslim communities until you need a reaction. Like we talked about, um, you know, like when I was at in the Quad Cities, when we had the Paris attacks, that was something that, um, all of a sudden people were asking me to go to the Muslim community, go to my local mosque. And, you know, obviously they had increased security measures, but uh, that's something that if I weren't there would have been a lot harder for another journalist to tackle uh, because they didn't have those relationships already in place. And so I think we should uh, get to that point where the way this says, we can as Muslim journalists cover a whole slew of issues and the community, the Muslim community can trust other journalists with their stories, with their narratives. So that's the ultimate goal, I think. Um, and I think that's where to start is to just put out the net, cast a wide net for the relationship and talk about what, what's important and what's going on. And hopefully you can cover one of those events sooner than later. Um, 
but you know, starting there is a good point. Mm -hmm. Rueda, what, what, what's your tips to anybody who doesn't have a Muslim journalist in their newsroom, but they have a community they should cover? And yeah, and you don't need to have a community. I think if you, if you have a newsroom, you have a community, right? They're, they're going to- I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Everywhere. Talking yes, yes. Muslim. Yes, it sh absolutely should be a, a priority to, to all newsrooms is what I'm saying. And so I, um, you know, again, to echo, you don't need to have a Muslim reporter to cover the, the Muslim American community. But I think a, a couple of quick tips, I think it's incredibly important to be inclusive and in talking to these communities beyond issues that you think are Muslim issues, right? Beyond whenever you're covering the travel ban, beyond whenever you're getting a, re a reaction to um, a, a terrorist attack that was perpetuated by a so-called Muslim, beyond these particular events. When you're talking about you know, the board meetings at school and you're just polling people, you, you wanna have a diverse type of people. You, you don't want a Muslim person, you want a black person, you want, you want all types of people. When you're talking about you know, COVID, you know, when you're talking to doctors, right, I promise you, you will find a, a Muslim doctor. It's a running joke in our community, you know, all of our, plenty of, you'll find the Dr. Muhammad's in all of the databases in all 50 states, I promise you. And so I think it matters when you are showing um, diversity and inclusivity in your sources. Again, your experts that you're talking to, in any cases, you want to make sure that you have diverse sources. So I would begin with looking up at your current coverage. When are you talking to the Muslim American community and during what types of coverage? Where can you improve and do better? Um, and I think that's going to be a great starting point. Um, Google is your friend. I think it's incredibly important to self-educate as a reporter when you are going out onto the field, if you are covering a specific event at an Islamic school or a mosque, or you're talking to you know, a town hall, know, you know, know who you're talking to, learn about this community, do your research. It's never good to go in blind. I think really just leaning in to our journalistic instance that we all were taught in J school, that we were all taught in the field about the importance of reporting and interviewing and calling. There are plenty of books and resources online. You know, we may only be 1% of the overall population, but the Muslim American community is as old as this history is, the first Muslims were Muslims who came from enslaved people, right? So during the founding of this country, you've, you've had you know, Muslims um, here. And challenge also, I think, even when you're talking to Muslims, I think be, be cognizant of the diversity um, of Muslim Americans. You're not just talking to the same Muslims. Yes, sometimes you wanna speak to the Imam, right, at the mosque, but you're talking to a black Muslim parent, um, an Arab Muslim doctor, you know, a Latino Muslim activist that you're keeping all of those things in mind. You know, when if you're really stuck and you don't know what to do, I think leaning into that journalistic gut and, and, and what, you know, what, we're, what we've been talking about. And I think really what I see the pitfalls is kind of comes to the lines of questioning. When you're preparing your interview questions, and I've seen this way too many times where a Muslim person does agree to an interview, whether it's on TV or radio or digital, and the questions that they're asked are just egregious, absolutely egregious. I saw a reporter um, ask a Muslim woman about uh, her, her niqab, you know, her face veil, and equated it to, to white supremacist symbols, and it, it continues to just blow my mind. So I would say be very critical of the questions that you're asking. Any person who's giving you the time to interview with you and talk with you is a person worth respecting and it's worth you, I think, doing, doing your homework and the Muslim community is no different. And I think you also have to just ask, yeah, uh, let me jump in real quick. I think it's also important to just ask questions, whether it's a Muslim man or Muslim woman. One time, and, and this is going to appall all of you, there's a, uh, a mall here in one of our suburbs in Dallas and uh, some Muslim women who were wearing their veils, they kicked them out because they said that, you know, hey, that's like a gang, a, a gang, you know, wear. And it was like, wait a minute, what? And so it just happened that someone, one of these women called me. And so we went out to interview them, but it was interesting because the one that called me, she's like, okay, you have a man behind the camera. He needs to step over there. Um, you can't, you know, we can't look directly in the camera. There was so much I learned from her. And unfortunately, you know, this, this um, you know, uh, mall ended up apologizing. Uh, again, their ignorance. Uh, but I learned so much from her. Um, you know, I also asked, uh, you know, I've never had never been in a mosque before. And, you know, someone told me the whole tour, you know, how women come in there, how you're supposed to be dressed. 
you know, and I thought that was very important. So as journalists out there who's listening to this, if you're not Muslim, ask questions. There's always somebody that's going to help you. I mean, I learned so much. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, Eamon, you were, you were going to say something? Thank you. Yeah, um, I was going to say, because um, we're trying to talk about um, gaining the Muslim community's trust, right? Um, I think this is really hard to do, uh, not just because of, you know, not speaking to Muslims, but just because of what people are already saying about Muslims. Like, think about the way that we talk about the media as this one uh, ginormous uh, singular organization, right? So there are Muslims out there who might be exposed to like Fox News, and then we'll just say, oh, well, you're from MSNBC, I don't want to talk to you. You're, you're part of the same media group, right? So um, when I was growing up, I didn't trust the news at all for those same reasons, because every time there was any kind of exposure about Muslims on the news, guaranteed it was going to be ignorant and wrong, and it's not relatable to my experience. But there was, I would trust The Daily Show. My, favorite, my news source for a long time was Comedy Central. You know, uh, and it wasn't because they would talk to Muslims. This is before Hassan Minhaj. It was awesome. The, uh, it's because they they let the people who were saying bigoted things about Muslims make fools of themselves. So even if you don't have a Muslim in your newsroom, there are Republicans talking about Muslims a lot who deserve to be uh, fact checked. You know, um, and especially in a place like Texas, where people are sending out mailers of pictures of women wearing hijab saying, elect us, we're going to solve the problem, you know? Uh, so local Texas reporters should talk about that. You know, they don't have to speak to Muslims to try and gain their trust. They should just be trying to uh, to stand for record, stand for truth. And in a lot of cases, you know, uh, do some fact-checking for, for bigotry. That'll really, I think, uh, win over a lot of Muslims, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. One of the things that I want to tell um, everybody who's, who's watching this, I, I'm sure I, I did my research, there's about 3.4 million Muslims in the US, am I right? Or is that is it bigger than that? Anybody? That's according to the research I did today, 3.4 million Muslims in the United States. And that means 3.4 million stories we can tell. Good stories. Doesn't have to be just because there's something Muslim happens, you know, whether it's this country across the ocean and it's negative, that you, that's all we cover because I know there, there's good stories to be told. And, and again, you're right. I always tell people the same thing. You don't have to be Latinos to cover the Latino community. I'm sure you, all three of you cover the Latino communities where you live. What do you tell news directors out there? By the way, do you even know if there is a big population of Muslim journalists out there? I mean, you know, because we have all these different organizations, right? Like NABJ, AAJA, all those. You know, are, are there many? Anybody? We've got we've got some social media groups. I know at least I'm a part of a couple. One for um, Muslim women in TV news, and then Muslim women journalists. So they are growing groups, and it's it's very nice and touching to see that because you feel supported in some way. You feel like you're in this together. It's small but mighty. I like to think of it as. I don't know if you guys have any others. Yeah, there are groups in New York City. Um, we get together often to just kind of uh, have some sandwiches and, and we invite like guests so that we can uh, like together learn and expand our skill sets and also network. It's really helpful. Well, uh, one of the things I definitely want to extend to you as the new president elect, by the way, the first woman of color to lead this organization for, uh, you know, in the first time in a hundred year history, um, I welcome you. I hope you join the Society of Professional Journalists because you know, we need all journalists. And, and one of the things is the diversity in our organization is so important. So uh, if I didn't invite you, and if you're not a member yet, please, I hope you join us because we do need your voice. What do you say to news directors or editors out there who do the hiring? Who, you know, I've heard it so many times, we can't find any, there's no one with experience. What do you say to them? You know, those that say, I can't find any, um, who, you know, really aren't making the effort. I mean. What do you say to them? What are what are they missing out? Let's just hear it. All right. So uh, one thing I think that news editors should really uh, to frame this conversation around is it's it's good for business. Like right? uh, it's good for their outlet. It's not just uh, good optics. It's not going to just help your brand by having a Muslim byline. Your content will be better 
And I think uh, it doesn't just go for Muslim uh, Muslim journalists, it's just anyone who who isn't part of your majority, I think, will improve the quality of the work. You, you will have a bigger audience, which means bigger traffic, which means more revenue. It's bad for business, I think, to not have at least one Muslim in your newsroom. And I know it might be harder for some outlets uh, than others. Like, if you want to be the token Muslim on Fox News primetime, good luck. Uh, but I think having that voice will improve their quality of work. Uh, and I think other journalists should think of it the same way. Mm -hmm. Tahira? I would agree with that. I would also add, um, trying to say this delicately, but I have seen news directors taking a chance on fresh out of college grads in at least TV news I can speak for um, that need a lot of work. Let's put it that way. Um, they need a lot of work writing. They need a lot of work with presentation skills. They need a lot of work with uh, shooting, editing, everything you need to do as a reporter when you're starting out in the field. Um, if you're willing to take a chance on a cookie cutter news reporter, traditional, you know, whoever it is, whether it's a woman or a man, uh, traditional looking news reporter, why not take that chance? Why not take that effort and initiative to mold a good reporter that is a different demographic, that represents a different demographic. So it could be a Muslim, it could be Latina, it could be a Black reporter, but think just maybe be a little bit more conscious of who you are choosing to designate your resources to, because right. not everyone is going to hit the ground running when you're a reporter, I understand that. Uh, but who do you see potential in and why? I think that's what you need to ask yourself because for years at my station, I saw reporters come in and out that I knew I was better at reporting. I knew in my heart, I was a better writer. I knew that I had more skills. I knew I knew more people in the community to be able to get better stories and have better pitches, more unique and in-depth pitches, but I kept seeing myself being passed over. Um, and I'm, very lucky that I was able to have these candid conversations at a certain point. And I think it helps, you know, when you're, when you're in those shoes and it's unfortunate that you, you can't just kind of say it as it is, you have to tiptoe lightly. Um, but that is essentially what I said. And I said, let's talk about the elephant in the room because I'm clearly the best candidate here, but there's a reason why I keep getting passed up. And I don't think I'm flourishing. I don't think I'm the best I can be behind the scenes. What can I do to change that? Um, and so they, they told me that it's not, we're not saying no, we're just saying not right now. And so I took that, even though I thought it was kind of a cop out at the time, but I was like, you know what? Maybe there's still hope and I, and I kept plowing on. And so I think it would have made it easier. Um, I mean, it was a very high chance at that at that point when I got rejected the second time that I was just gonna drop out completely and give up. And so I think it would have been a lot easier if maybe management, maybe not even just your news director, your general manager, because it goes all the way to the top when you're at these TV stations. Mm -hmm. Think about when you're talking behind closed doors, why do you see more potential in one person who looks one way and not the other person? Let's have a real thoughtful discussion about that before you choose your candidates. Well, and I think in TV news, I, I worked in seven TV stations from Toledo, Ohio, to Los Angeles, to Dallas. It's just, you know, I mean, it's all about appearance and, you know, they don't wanna have the conversation. And, and sometimes I believe in the majority of my bosses were white men and they feel comfortable with white people in the next, you know, men or women. And so, you know, kudos to you because you spoke up and kudos to you for not giving up and leaving because I wonder how many women, you know, women of color, women who are Muslim walked away because you lose that hope. So, you know, you are, all three of you guys are, are inspiring in that area. Um, I, I, I think when you look at news directors or news editors at, at some of these publications, is it, is it because also they don't understand because also they, they don't understand the Muslim community do you think that's one of the reasons they, they put up that wall? I mean, I think the issue goes beyond 
um, a series of managers or directors. Again, I think this is an industry-wide problem. I and mean, if we look at the how the historical context of how media and you know journalism first worked, it was speaking for and to the people who are worth speaking for and to. And that was, you know, white men and by large white people. And I think again, we're still going through this this national reckoning in terms of having diverse newsrooms and also just better reflecting our communities. And I think we need to understand everything. I think what, you know, Thahad and Ayman were seeing that, yes, it's a business case. And yes, it's about um, taking a chance on these people. But it's also because we're good at our jobs. I think it, it comes down to the simple fact, why should you do it? Because you're required to as a newsroom. It's your basic journalistic duty to tell the stories and hold people accountable. And if you're not going to tell stories of one of the most marginalized communities of this country, then you're not, you're not functioning as to how your newsroom should function, whether you're broadcast or digital or radio. And I think the issue is a lot less about convincing them. I think most people would agree, yes, we, you know, we want more diverse candidates and we want most diverse stories. I don't think the issue is there, but I think they come, the, the co-opting reasons come into other things like Sahara was saying, yes, but not right now, or bro, when we get a bigger budget, but when, um, you can prove to us that, you know, this is an, a niche audience that, you know, this is worth in, investing in. And I think they, these are some of the real languages that we continue to hear as journalists that we have to continuously prove as to why talking to and about our community is worthy. And I think it's outdated. I think it's poor journalism. And I think it's a tactic that is just unfortunately built into the subconscious of journalists and journalism. And unless you come from these marginalized communities, you're not going to notice, quite frankly, uh, because if you come from you know a privileged family, went to a wealthy school, and were able to, to get a job in, in journalism, and you want to, you know, speak truth to power, you're not going to understand what those power dynamics look like. And so I think it's, in, it's incredibly important to, I think, think a little bit more critically about, about these questions. I think everyone has good and well intentions, but I think if we truly want to up, uphold the ideals and standards of journalism, we need to move a lot faster than the pace that we're moving at now. Hmm. Well, we hope so. <laughs> I mean, we hope so, but it just always seems that, you know, people are always talking diversity, inclusion, diversity, inclusion. And I always tell people, you know, for, for people of color, diversity is lip service. For white people, I think it's always like, you know, makes them feel warm and fuzzy. We need to get past that. We need yeah, to and not just hot, not just, I mean, if you're looking to hire, I mean, we're right here, you know, all our exactly. contacts are available. If you want it, like, we'll take, we'll look at job promotions. We know plenty of other qualified people, but it's beyond hiring. I mean, journalism is a cutthroat industry. We face layoffs after layoffs. It's insane. Um, I think there was an anecdote comparing the journalism, the journalism industry to, to coal mining. I think I read in a report not too long ago, but you need to retain us also. You need to promote us. You need to keep us. You need to listen to us because like you said, um, you know, Re Rebecca and what Sahara was saying, I have seen loads of people leave this industry who were passionate, who were dedicated and who were not valued for, for their work. And so they left. There's a reason why people of color, including Muslim Americans are leaving. So yes, I love to see your hiring statistic, but I would love to see your promotion and your retention because that's equally as important. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, uh, you know, the beauty about all of us is, you know, even if we have jobs, we know somebody. So just because we have jobs, it doesn't mean we don't know somebody that can fill that, that, um, that opportunity. And yeah, you know, there's probably other journalists out there that, yeah, have, have quit and, you know, maybe we can bring them back. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, I know there's questions out there. If you have any questions, put them in the chat and I'll ask them. Um, I guess, you know, before we wrap this up, because I know we're, you know, some of you have to go off and cover the Biden-Harris uh, speeches tonight. Um, I, 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 I guess, you know, are you all three? Because you guys have already made your groove. I mean, come on, you guys are accomplished. Like I said, I mean, you guys are all role models, not only as journalists, but as, as when you look at Muslim journalists, you guys are role models. You're a role model for all of us because you all speak up, you all have, you know, created something in, in the area of journalism that has never been, been looked at. 
I mean, you know, that rarely is. Um, I guess your, your, your words of wisdom to people out there who, who think that, you know, yeah, your community is worth covering, but, you know, I mean, you know, are you guys hopeful that journalism will get better when it concerns the Muslim community? Are you hopeful that more bosses out there will be hiring you? Are you? I can start by saying yes, I definitely am. I One of the recent stories that kind of came full circle for me is um, when I first got hired to be a TV reporter, a uh, another Muslim woman who wears a hijab, she is a producer um, out in the East Coast somewhere. And she messaged me saying, I have been trying to do the same thing. This is inspiring. Um, this motivates me to keep going and keep trying. Um, a year later, she posted in an M.M. Jane group, a multimedia journalist for women group, um, with a picture of her and her photographer. And that was the same woman. I was like, did you become a reporter? And she said, yes, I wow. just became a reporter a few months ago. And I just, it, I just felt so overwhelmed because it is just so amazing to see a ripple effect, right? If you have a news director who says, okay, you know what, and a general manager, um, we see a good journalist, we're gonna put her out there with or without hijab, it's gonna come with, they know, and I'm not naive either, I know it comes with connotation. People see a hijab and there are so many other things that they think about. They're not necessarily thinking about your journalism, your, the fact that you're a journalist and you made it on air because you're qualified. They're, they're looking for every little thing they can to say that this girl shouldn't belong here. And yeah. so for a news director to overlook that, I feel was so powerful and it showed because in other markets, it makes it a little bit easier. And I hope that that continues. I know there's another uh, woman, Muslim woman who wears a hijab in um, Minnesota. And so I'm just hoping that we start with local news and we work our way up and eventually it's not a token. It's not anything besides you turn it on, you turn on the TV and you see someone that looks like your neighbor. That's when we'll see you on CNN or someone, right? <laughs> Probably. All right, we have one question and this is kind of a very positive thing. So we have a few minutes. Is there a favorite story you're proud of that we should uh, read? Was it about the Muslim community or another topic? Well, for, you know, before, you know, you got to look at Amen series. That is just all positive. But anyway, do you have a favorite real quick? Because we have probably like six minutes. Yes, I do. There is a, I'll, I'll get quick because I know Tejeda and, uh, and Oida have awesome stories. The, my favorite story that I've ever done, I just put out about a month ago. It was about the store owners who own Cup Foods, which is uh, the store in Minneapolis that uh, called the police on George Floyd and started the global movement. Uh, they are Muslim and in the basement of Cup Foods is a mosque. Uh, so uh, with my, uh, you know, uh, credentials as a Muslim journalism, they trusted me right away and were very open and candid uh, and even introduced me to the person who made the 911 call and, and gave my company the scoop. We were the only ones to talk to him. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it, it hits what we're talking about right now, where the um, hiring Muslim journalists will give you access to the Muslim community. And that is important. Uh, but I think that was one of my favorite stories because of the experience and being. What, what a great story. Can you share that link? Can you look it up real quick and put it in the chat for us? We, I, I want to see it. I, I, what a great story. Another layer to that. Okay. All right. Um, Roweda, you want to give us your favorite story? Yeah, um, I'm going to go with two, but I'll make them quick. One was about, um, I did a story documenting the experiences of Muslim women swimming in America and it touched upon um, the concept of policing women's bodies, especially Muslim women who wore, you know, the burkini or just, you know, uh, swimsuits that were more modest. Um, and it touched upon incredible themes uh, tied it back to racial segregation in America and how um, the African American community was policed when it comes to bodies of water when they went swimming and also talked about the fashion industry, the tokenization of the fashion industry, et cetera. And uh, this search for wanting to find joy um, in one of just, you know, the world's favorite pastimes and the complexities that comes with swimming. It's packaged with beautiful photos and it's uh, definitely one of my favorite stories. It's uh, something that 
most people don't think about when they go swimming and taps into how Muslim women think twice, three, four times uh, when, when they go swimming and all the different layers that comes with it. So that's definitely one. And my second one was one I wrote um, earlier this year called Chasing Safety. It followed the route of two men who are from Yemen who had death threats out against them, who fled Yemen, uh, made it to South America, to Ecuador in specific, uh, where they were found uh, there by people who wanted to, wanted them dead. And then they made the journey across, you know, about seven, eight countries going from Ecuador all the way up to the U.S. on foot, on buses, on trains, all to make it to the U.S. Uh, where they were denied asylum and told that they did not have credible fear and that they could not stay in the U.S. and they were at risk of being reported back um, to Yemen where they were wanted dead. And so the story really um, talks about the complexities of different immigration policies, the search for safety, um, and really touched home uh, about these two men's journey. And, and after the publication of my report, the decision was reversed. Um, and one of the men was granted full asylum and the other one was freed in the U.S. while he gets to pursue his case. And so I think it's a piece of journalism that um, highlights this concept of impact and I'm just so incredibly proud of. Congratulations, thank you for doing it. Tahira, you, yeah, you got 30 seconds to tell us your baby. Real quick, yeah, um, my all time favorite story is actually doesn't have anything to do with the Muslim community. Uh, it's a story I did about a, a veteran who was facing homelessness uh, in Iowa and he had gotten a notice of eviction and from his apartment complex management and they wouldn't give him an answer as to why, he wouldn't give me an answer as to why, but long story short, after I aired the piece, um, two separate groups who had seen the story kind of mobilized on their own. Uh, and within two weeks, less than two weeks, uh, one group of veterans moved, packed up his house, moved him out, got him a moving truck. Uh, another state senator who had seen my story uh, contacted one of her friends to put a deposit down, an emergency deposit on another apartment unit, and he was all set to go. Um, and he called me crying and just thanking me for, for listening to him, essentially, and sharing his story. So that's definitely been my all-time favorite story. All right. Beautiful. First of all, I want to thank all of you. I'm so glad that everybody got to meet you tonight. You guys are inspiring. You're encouraging your role models. Thank you for what you do for journalism. Thank you for what you do for the Muslim community. And I hope you'll join SPJ as I tell every, everybody who's watching. Um, thank you so much to all of you. To everybody tuning in, again, this is the Society of Professional Journalists. I'm Rebecca Aguilar. Thank you for joining us on this conversation. Keep the talks going. It is important to have diverse newsrooms. All right, you guys have a good night, everybody. Thank you again. Assalamu alaikum. Happy Bye. Election Day. <laughs>